I shared with you at the beginning of this series of messages on the Holy Spirit that I grew up in a church that didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit. In fact, he wasn't brought up very often at all. And when he was, sadly, sometimes it was negative. Now understand, we were a Bible-believing church. We held the Bible in highest regard. We revered the Scriptures. We believed it to be the Word of God. But the way that it was interpreted to us led us to believe that the Holy Spirit and the things we saw Him do in Jesus' life and the way we saw Him work in the book of Acts ended when the last apostle died and when the canon of Scripture, that is what is now the New Testament, had come together, that once we had the Bible, we no longer needed the Holy Spirit working in that way. It's known as cessationist theology. That's what I grew up believing. That's what I grew up being taught in, in the church that I did most of my growing up in. We believe that the Holy Spirit had two basic uh, ministries today. One was called conviction. That is, we believed it was the Holy Spirit who made us feel guilty as all get out when we did something we shouldn't do, all right? And so that was the Holy Spirit's work. And then we also believed that he helped us understand the Bible. It's called illumination. But outside of that, there wasn't much the Holy Spirit was doing. We were warned to beware of those charismatics, you know. And they weren't just called charismatics. They were always called those charismatics. And it's the same kind of those that some of you use when you talk about your in-laws. You know what I'm saying? You know, those, whatever the, their last name is. And you know you're in trouble when you say it, but that's kind of the way we do it. We were taught that tongues was not for today. And that the gift of tongues, if anything, was demonic. And that we should be careful about asking for such things or asking for gifts from the Holy Spirit or asking for more of the Holy Spirit because in doing so, we might actually be opening our lives up to a demon. Now, in the midst of growing up in a church like this, and I'm not the only one who grew up in a church like this. I know some of you did as well. In the midst of growing up in a church like this, there was a historical figure who often came up in our pastor's sermons or in revival services when we had special speakers or even when I became a minister, a pastor, at pastor's conferences I would go to. He was a man from the 1800s by the name of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was an evangelist in the 1800s whom God used mightily, I mean in mighty ways, in both the United States of America and in England. Now, I want you to just kind of keep, keep, keep that in mind because I'll come back to him in just a moment. I feel a call to ministry, and I enroll in a college and begin my preparing for ministry at Tocoa Falls College just down the road here in uh, Tocoa, Georgia. It was a non-denominational school at the time, very biblically based, but it wasn't one of the schools that my church wanted me to go to. I spent four years at Tocoa Falls College, and when I came out, I... I would have to say that concerning the Holy Spirit, I was no longer a cessationist. I had grown. I'd become a every so oftenist. You know what I mean by that? The Holy Spirit might not work like he used to, but every so often, he's going to throw you a bone. You know what I'm saying? Every so often. Every so often, you'll pray for somebody who's sick and they'll get healed. Every so often... Uh, you will, you know, get a word of knowledge. Every so often you'll feel his power when you're ministering, but it's just every so often. Now, you know, now, just give me a little bit of credit. That's a big step from being a cessationist. Are you with me so far, everybody? So I'm now an every so oftenist, if I could just make up a word. But as I ministered, as I as I served the Lord as a youth pastor, as a pastor in some churches in this denomination, I began to realize that something wasn't quite right. It always seemed that something was missing. When I looked at the churches I was in and what the Bible said about the churches, it didn't connect. When I looked at my own life and I looked at the Bible, something just didn't line up. And around 1988, 1999, I was in a small group gathering of pastors. There were four of us, all in the same denomination, because, well, we just didn't do much cross-pollinating back then, if you know what I mean, all right? And so there, there were four of us, and we're all from the same denomination, and, and we began to meet once a month, 
And the, the first meeting was just like you would expect when four men sat down together. We're kind of, you know, sizing each other up and talking about small talk. And, you know, no one's going to open up too much. And then the, the second meeting was a little bit of the same. And then the third meeting, we're a little more open. About the fourth time we met, uh, one of the guys, he was about my age at the time. We're all in our late 30s. Uh, his name was Todd. Uh, We're we're sitting around eating lunch one day together, and Todd says, I want to ask you guys a question. And the other three guys and I said, well, go ahead, what's your question? And he he said this, he says, do you think there is more to the Holy Spirit than we've been taught? And I said yes. I mean, before I even thought about it, I said yes. Because this had been on my mind for quite some time. And I was noticing a disconnect between Scripture, what what I was taught, all these kind of things. And that day, I went home, and I got before the Lord, and I asked the Lord for this. I said, Lord, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I don't want to be gullible and just believe anything. At the same time, I don't want to be skeptical and, and, and hold you and hold him at arm's distance. Lord, I'm asking you for one thing. Give me fresh eyes on your scriptures. Give me fresh eyes on your word that I can read it maybe like I've never read it before. And that when I come across passages that I've been told they believe a certain thing, uh, that, 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 that they mean a certain thing, Lord, help me to see them as they really are and help me to simply ask the question, if, if someone hadn't told me this means this, would I come to that same conclusion? Does that make sense to you so far? And so, Lord, let me read the Word as a child. Open it up and make it new to me. And so I really adopted a blank page approach, if you will, when it came to especially the Holy Spirit and wanting to learn about Him, who He is, and how He operates in our world. I also began doing some other studying, some other reading, some other research. And interestingly, I came across a book entitled Why God Used D.L. Moody, It was a book written by R.A. Torrey, who was a uh, contemporary of Moody and who was a friend of his and a ministry partner of his. And in this book, which was actually a sermon that R.A. Torrey had preached like in 1923 and then it got transposed into a book, he tells the story of how in the late 1800s, D.L. Moody was a hardworking, hustling preacher in the Chicago area. He would preach regularly at the YMCA. Now, I know when you think about the YMCA, you think about that place across from AdMed where you go and work out, all right? Well, the YMCA was originally the Young Men's Christian Association. And so he would preach regularly at the Chicago YMCA. And he would preach hard, he would preach fervently, but he was operating in his own strength. And as much as he tried, he wasn't seeing much fruit for his labor. Not much was happening. Well, these two elderly ladies began attending his meetings. One's name was Auntie Cook, and the other's name was Mrs. Snow. And they would attend D.L. Moody's meetings at the YMCA in Chicago. And every evening when he concluded and the service was over, they would come forward and they would say to him, Mr. Moody, we're praying for you. And then they'd leave. They'd come back the next time they had a meeting. Mr. Moody, we're praying for you. And then they'd leave. And this this happened again and again and again. And it kind of started to get on D.L. Moody's nerves. These two old women, every time I finish preaching, come tell me they're praying for me. What's this all about? Well, on one particular night, they came forward and they said to him again, Mr. Moody, we just want you to know that we're praying for you. And he said to them, why are you praying for me? Why don't you pray for the lost? And they said, Mr. Moody, we're praying that you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Moody said to them, I've already received all the Holy Spirit there there, there was when I got saved. But these women kept praying and kept letting him know. And so finally, one night, they came forward and they said, Mr. Moody, we've been praying for you. And, 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 And he said, ladies, instead of praying for me, would you please pray with me? 
because he began to realize that his life lacked the supernatural. His life lacked the power of God. There was something missing in his preaching. There was something missing in the way he talked to people. There was an element that wasn't there. And so that night at the YMCA, at CA, after this meeting, he knelt, he prayed, these ladies prayed, and he got up and went about his business. Nothing really happened that night. A few days later, Moody was in New York City preparing to go to England. And here's how R.A. Torrey records it. R.A. Torrey says, Moody was walking up Wall Street in New York, and in the midst of the bustle and hurry of that city, his prayer was answered. The power of God fell upon him as he walked up the street and he had to hurry off to the house of a friend and ask that he might have room by himself. And in that room he stayed alone for hours and the Holy Ghost came upon him, filling his soul with joy. That at last he had to ask God to withhold his hand lest he die on the spot from very joy. He went out from that place with the power of the Holy Ghost upon him. And when he got to London, the power of God wrought through him mightily in London, in North London, and hundreds were added to the churches. I read that and I thought, my goodness. This man who we revered in a church that didn't believe much about the Holy Spirit we revered him because he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Somehow they managed to leave that part of the story out. And I began to understand, you know what? If D.L. Moody needs the Holy Spirit, Kendall needs the Holy Spirit. If D.L. Moody needed the Holy Spirit to minister in power, Lord have mercy, I needed it because I needed something. Are you with me so far, everybody? Now here's what I want you to understand. D.L. Moody told these women, he said, I received all the Holy Spirit there was to receive when I got saved. The truth of the matter is, D.L. Moody was partly right. Because when you gave your heart to Jesus, he gave you the Holy Spirit. He, he, he came into your heart. In fact, what I want to talk about just real quickly this morning is the two-fold ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. The twofold ministry that the Holy Spirit has in the life of everyone who has come to Christ. The Gospels bear this out. The letters of Paul bear this out. And all I'm asking you to do this morning is this. Open up your heart to what God has to say in his word. And whether you've been taught this before or not, I want you open to it. Open your heart to God's word. Open your heart to what he has for you. Because I believe there are some people in this room this morning that God wants to do for you what he did for me at this time in my life and what he continues to do for me on a regular basis. The twofold ministry of the Holy Spirit, I would state it like this. Number one, the Holy Spirit indwells us with new life. He indwells us with new life. When you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit was deposited in you to live in you. He took up residence in your life, and now he is now a part of your life. In John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22, I, I read something interesting. Here's what it says. It says, that Sunday evening. Now, just so you'll understand, the Sunday evening in question is the Sunday of the resurrection. That morning, Jesus had risen from the dead. He'd been seen by Mary Magdalene, all right? And so, he's, he's risen from the dead. He's been seen by Mary Magdalene. Now, it's that same evening. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. Now, just a little side note, all right? If you ever come up on a locked door and God empowers you to walk right through it or just appear on the other side, it's a good idea to say peace be with you to the people who are there because if you don't, you're going to freak them out, all right? Are you with me so far, okay? And so, so Jesus appears to them. He says, peace be with you. And then verse 20 says, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands, and his side, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. 
Again, he said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he says this. And then he does this. It says, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This was the day of salvation for the disciples. Salvation as we know it was not available until the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so the resurrected Christ appears to his disciples locked in a room, afraid of the Jews, and he breathes on them and he says, I want you to breathe this in and receive the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, Holy Spirit became resident in their lives, just as in your life, the day you gave your life to Jesus, Holy Spirit became resident in your life. Are you with me so far, everybody? All right. But the story doesn't end there. The Holy Spirit indwells us with new life, but he's got a second ministry, and it's this. The Holy Spirit saturates us with real power. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we read this. Scripture says, on one occasion, and this was an occasion after John 20. Right? Scripture tells us that after Jesus' resurrection for 40 days, he would appear from time to time with his disciples. 40 days after the resurrection. 40 days after the Sunday morning I just read about a few moments ago. This is one of those occasions. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now think about this for a moment. On the day that he rose from the dead, Jesus says to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. A few days later, or maybe a few weeks later, he says to them, in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he goes on to say this, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Indwelling empowerment. Two different ministries. Two different steps the apostle paul i think alludes to this in in his letter to the ephesians in ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 through 14 paul says this when you believe that's past tense right when you believe past tense did, did you guys take english okay when you believe okay past tense when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance again paul's pointing out when you gave your life to jesus holy spirit took up residence in you he's a deposit guaranteeing your future guaranteeing your eternity but then a few verses later beginning in verse 18 paul says i pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know may know, as in you might not know it yet, in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Do you see this, everybody? The Holy Spirit indwells us with new life. But that's not all he wants to do in our lives. He also wants to saturate us with real power. Uh, let me see if this helps you understand this a little bit. I, I've got some, uh, some tools this morning that uh, maybe will help you, all right? Let's take this sponge, all right? And let's just, let's just say this sponge is you. This sponge is you, all right? Like SpongeBob. Is there, Bob, SpongeBob. All right, there we go, all right. And so this sponge is you. Now, one day you came to Jesus. And when you came to Jesus, you got in. I got this from my dentist. That's about what it looks like, isn't it? 
Uh, hold on, son. Hold on, son. Be still. This ain't going to hurt much. And then you won't feel nothing. I wouldn't drink soup today if I were you. All right. All right. So, so Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is deposited in me. Here we go. He's deposited in me. And he is in there to stay. He is in there for good. All right. And he guarantees my eternity. He's indwelling me. He is in me. But Scripture also talks about this, being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that there's a difference in water being in this sponge and this sponge being saturated with water? There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. I mean like a mighty difference. And so now, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we're baptized in Him, what happens? Now we're dripping in Him. We're oozing Him. He's everywhere. He's flowing out of us. He's, he's touching others through us. He is impacting and affecting everyone around us. Does this make sense to you, everybody? All right. Why would I want to be dry when I can be immersed and saturated? You know what? I forgot to get a towel. That's all right. One day I'll learn to think my stories. At least I wore dark pants, all right? And so uh, are you with me? Now, here's the question I want to ask, all right? Why is this important? Why would God do it this way? I mean, wouldn't it be simpler to get everything at one point, at one time? Wouldn't it be simpler if it's all of a sudden the day you got saved, you got saved, you got immersed in the Holy Spirit, it's all done in one deal? I, I think you did it different because these ministries are different. These ministries are different. And um, in fact, if I could, I want to I wanna coin a new phrase this morning. All right? You know, a lot of us, I know a lot of Christians, maybe not you, but I know a lot of Christians who, when the idea of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is brought up, that, that they withdraw and they cringe because of some things they've seen in the past, some things they've heard in the past, or, or maybe you went forward in one of these churches where they gather around you and they hollered and yelled and hollered and yelled and hollered and yelled until you finally yelled back, and you're like, it's kind of weird, I'm not sure anything happened, all right? And so we look at baptism, and we kind of cringe from it. And, you know, we talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's a different word. And what's that all about? Um, listen, let's not get hung up on, 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 on words. Are you with me? Let's not get hung up on what other folks have said. I mean, it's kind of like this. You know, you can call it a sweet potato. You can call it a sweet potato. Or you can call it a sweet tater. But I want it with my steak. You know what I'm saying, everybody? All right? So whether you call it the baptism of the Spirit or the, the filling of the Spirit or, or, the, or the anointing of the Spirit or whatever you call it, I want it. Okay? I want it. I want to give you a new word. Saturation. The saturation of the Holy Spirit. Saturation. It came to me yesterday as I was painting. Saturation of the Holy Spirit because I was saturated with paint. Saturation of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, when, when, when something is saturated, it has so much water in it, it can't hold anymore. All right? It has so much in it, it's dripping. Okay? It has so much in it, it's dripping. But you know what? When something is saturated, think about this. Okay? This sponge, this, this sponge right now, I'm coming back to it. All right? This sponge right now, it's saturated. But guess what? Once I squeeze it out, it's not saturated. All right? Once it's been used, it's not saturated. It needs more water. Or if I were to take this sponge and just leave it there long enough, it'd dry out. It wouldn't be saturated. We need to continually go back. Are you with me, everybody? We need to continually go back. And so that's why there, there's a twofold ministry. Think about it like this, all right? Why is it different? Number one, salvation is for eternity. But saturation is for living today. Does that make sense? Salvation is for eternity. When I gave my life to Jesus, he gave his life to me. I became a new creature. Holy Spirit took up residence in my life. He's living there. He's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me. I am set for eternity. I'm guaranteed for eternity. But I need something to get through today. And that's why I need to be saturated with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you another way to think about it. Uh, salvation. Salvation reproduces the life of Jesus in me. But saturation reproduces the ministry of Jesus in me. Do you see the difference? It's important to have new life, but it's also important 
You know, Jesus told his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Jesus also told his disciples, you've seen what I've done. Greater works than these you'll do. The only way we can do that is when we're saturated with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a, a third one. Salvation. At salvation, I receive all of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you might want to argue me about that and feel free, but I believe at salvation, I received all the Holy Spirit. You know, um, the, the, the Word says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. When you gave your life to Jesus, He gave you everything He had to give. At salvation, I receive all the Holy Spirit. Hear me carefully. But at saturation, the Holy Spirit receives all of me. And there's the difference. There's the difference. You see, there's some of us in this room this morning, and we're living powerless lives. We're living lives where we're always tripping up over temptation. The same things are always dragging us down. We're dealing with the same anger issues. We're dealing with the same addiction issues. We're, we're, we're dealing with the same porn issues. We're dealing with all these same issues. And the reason is, although God has given us all of him, we've not really given him all of us. And we're holding things back. And we're holding areas back. And we're not giving him license to step into that area of our lives. And because of that, we're not saturated. Are you with me, everybody? And because of that, there is no power. At saturation, the Holy Spirit receives all of me. Think about this, all right? I find it interesting that in Acts chapter 2, and you can read this yourself when you get home. In Acts chapter 2, we're told that flames of fire appeared above the heads of everyone in, in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came, and they all began speaking in different languages, in other tongues. They all began speaking in other tongues. Now, think about this just for a moment. Why did God choose that sign? Why did God choose that sign? I mean, if, if I'd have been God, I don't think I'd have done it that way. I'd, I'd have done like, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you levitate. Wouldn't that be cool? We could tell who's full, they float. But that's why I'm not God, all right? And, uh, you know, and so uh, Kendall Almighty, that would not be a good idea, all right? And so, no, here's why. Here's why. James said, James says, no man can rule his tongue. No man can rule his tongue. A man can't control his tongue. But the Holy Spirit can when he has all of me. Are you with me? He wants all of me. He wants all of me. And it was just through studying this and reading this and, and praying over this that I found myself coming to a place where one evening with a few friends, I got on my face before God. I said, Lord, I'm giving you all of me I've, I know to give. Every bit of me I'm giving to you. I'm holding nothing back from you. And Lord, I'm trusting you right now to, to immerse me, baptize me, saturate me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, whether I feel anything or not, I'm going to believe you've done this. Whether I speak in some new language or not, I'm going to believe you've done this. Because as I receive Jesus by faith, I'm giving my whole life over to the Holy Spirit by faith. I'm going to stand up in faith believing you've done a mighty work in my life. And you know what God did? He did. In Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, Jesus makes a statement. And, and this was really the scriptures that kind of put me over the edge on my journey. In Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through, through 13, Jesus said, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? 
Now, here's why that was important to me. Because I was told earlier in life, be careful what you ask for. Don't ask for those gifts. You might get a demon. You might get a what? A demon. Interestingly, demons are referred to in Scripture as snakes and scorpions. And Jesus says, hey, if you being a, be, be, be an, a, a sinful father, a, a marred father, a messed up father, if your kids ask you for something, are you going to give them a snake? No. Are you going to give them a scorpion? No. Are you going to give them a demon? No. Neither will your heavenly father keep the Holy Spirit from those who ask for him. And so here's my question for you. Are you ready and willing to ask for the Holy Spirit? I'm not saying, have you asked before? Remember, my sponge is no longer saturated. It's still a little bit wet. No longer saturated. I'm going to electrocute somebody up here. It's, no, it's, it's still wet, but if I leave it there, it'll be dry as a bone. There are some people in this room, I have a feeling, there's some folks watching online, who you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that rocked your world, and you're still relying on that. When was the last time you opened up your life for a fresh work, for him to do something fresh in your life? Has it ever occurred to you that from that moment, that you were first immersed in the Holy Spirit, that maybe you've grown a little bit, your life has expanded, and there's more to you to fill? We need to come back for more. We cannot afford in these days, in these days that we're living, to be people who are empty or a quarter full or three quarters full. We can't afford to be people living on last yesterday's or last week's or last month's encounter with God. We've got to be full today. We've got to be full today. If we're going to turn this culture around, we've got to be full today. If you're going to make a difference in your family, you've got to be full today. Those, of, those parents who are down here dedicating your children, you've got to be full. There's no way you'll pull it off. There's no way you'll raise that, ch that, that child by your own strength, in, in your own power by your own wisdom, we've got, to be, we've got to be full. There's no way we'll see this place become the place God wants it to be if we try to do it by our own power, by our own means. We've got to be full of Him. There's no way you'll build a youth group on your own power. There's no way you'll see a youth group on your own power. You've got to be full. There's no way you'll see a kid's ministry flourish if we try to do it on our own power. We've got to be full of Him. Am I making sense to you, everybody? I want to leave you with this. Maybe you've met someone like this. I have. People who had some kind of an experience with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they used it to make you feel inferior to them. Or maybe you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and because of it, you now feel superior to other people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Listen, we are not going to be a church of haves and have-nots. Are you with me? We're not going to be a church of haves and have-nots. Where some of us look down our noses at people who don't have gifts we have or haven't had the experience of the Holy Spirit that we've had. Because the Holy Spirit didn't come to make me better than you or you better than me. I want you to understand something. Why do I need, why do I need, need to be saturated with the Holy Spirit? Here's why. Being saturated with the Holy Spirit does not make me better than you. It makes me better than me. And that's what I need. Come on, somebody. That's what I need. Being saturated with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. And this church needs the best me I can give you. And this church needs the best you you can give her too. And this world needs the best you you can give her. This country needs the best you you can give her. And I dare not, I dare not try to do that outside of the saturation of the Holy Spirit. Do you receive that this morning? Does it make sense to you this morning? Let's bow our heads as the band comes up for our next song. I've got two questions for you. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about this? 
That's the first question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about this? And number two, what are you going to do about it? You're going to sit back, go home, do nothing, hope whatever's going on in your heart right now wears off, or are you going to move? Are you going to step forward? There's some people in this room who would be willing to admit, I'm not living at full power. I'm living at half capacity, quarter capacity, almost empty. I'm in the red zone. I'm so dry. Right now, the Holy Spirit wants to immerse you. Jesus wants to immerse you in his spirit anew and afresh. And if you're here today and, 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 and you... And you would agree with that. And the Holy Spirit speaking to you that it's time for you to give me more of you. Would you just lift your hand so I can pray for you? I need more. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I need more. I need more. I need more. I need to give you more. This is what I want to do. I want to ask you to come forward so I can pray with you. Not one-on-one. -on -one. I just want to pray with you. So if your hand's up, come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Let's pray together. You know, Jesus said, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is what I want you to do. Right here. I just want you to ask. That's what I did. I just asked. I just asked. When I asked, He did it. He answered. He answered. Maybe you're here and He is. He's talking to you already about there's something in your life you're holding back from Him. There's something in your life you're holding back from Him. That little closet. You got to give it to him. Here's what I've learned about the Holy Spirit. Here's what I've learned about God. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't negotiate. And by standing here today, what we're saying is this. Lord, I'm giving you all of me. All of me. And I'm holding nothing back from you. I'm holding nothing back from you. Lord God. I thank you, Lord, I thank you for these who have come. And Lord God, some of us have been before you before to be immersed in your spirit, and you've come through and you've done mighty things, marvelous things. Lord, there are some who are here for the first time. Jesus, you said that our Heavenly Father would not keep the Holy Spirit from those who ask. And so, God, we're here this morning, and we ask. We ask. Immerse us. Saturate us with you. Saturate us with you. Lord, we're tired of man-powered, woman-powered ministry. God, we're tired of trying our best only to come up short. God, we're tired of the limits of our own thoughts, our own creativity, our own energy levels. And right now, God, we empty ourselves of us. And we simply say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. And fill us. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, come and fill us in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. And Lord, by faith, by faith, we receive that. By faith, we walk away believing we are empowered anew and afresh. 
Lord, by faith, we believe you are pouring new gifts into us. And Lord, we hold nothing back from you. We hold nothing back from you. And Lord, by faith, we're going to walk out of here empowered to change our world, to change our world. In Jesus' name. And we got a song we're going to sing. And it's very apropos to what's happening right here, right now. I want you just to join with the band as we sing. And let's just give God thanks. Give God thanks. Give God thanks for what he's doing among us right now.